Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are excited to have you here today. Um, we've got a really exciting hour where we are going to be talking about BirdCast, which is one of my favorite projects at the lab to talk about. Um, I'm going to welcome on our panelists so they can give a quick wave and hello before I jump into some announcements. So we have Andrew Farnsworth, Audrey Carlson, and Julia Wang. We'll hear from them in just a minute, including a little bit about their backgrounds. Um, but first, I want to do a few introductions. Um, so uh, today's webinar is coming to you from the Lab of Ornithology. Um, and my name is Lisa Kopp. I'm on the Visitor Center team at the lab. Um, and I'll be moderating and facilitating today's conversation. Like I said, the people you really want to hear from are our panelists. Um, but I will be relaying your questions and comments along to them throughout the way. Um, so today's webinar is being hosted from Ithaca, New York. And I want to read a statement acknowledging the Indigenous people as the original inhabitants of this area. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayokono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayokono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayokono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayokono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, part of uh, Cornell University, is home to a community of researchers and supporters from around the world. Um, and we appreciate birds and biodiversity and the integral role that uh, birds play in our ecosystems. And our mission is to advance leading edge research, education, and citizen science to help solve pressing conservation challenges. And you'll hear some of those today. So uh, a couple of tech notes before we get started. Um, we are, uh, we are going to have closed captioning available on Zoom. So that's an option that you can choose on the bottom uh, panel or on your, your bottom toolbar in Zoom. Um, you can hide or show the captions if you need those. Um, we are going to be doing, we're going to be hearing from uh, all three of our panelists. We're going to start out with Audrey, um, who's going to talk about the dashboard feature in BirdCast and how you can use this. Then we're going to hear from Julia about how we can help birds uh, right now during migration and throughout the year. And then Andrew's going to talk about what's happening right now out there during sort of peak migration season and some of the big picture ideas around BirdCast. Um, and so we're going to take questions for each of the presenters in between their presentations, and then we'll have some time at the end to, to finish up with questions as well. Um, so we're going to use the Q&A in Zoom for your questions, and we're just going to use the chat for any tech issues. So that's the place if like all of a sudden you can't hear me or are, you know something's really choppy or you can't see a screen, you can put that in the chat. Um, and we've got some great colleagues behind the scenes who are helping uh, with the chat and with the Q&A. Um, we are also streaming on YouTube. So hello to those of you watching on YouTube. We're excited to have you. And you can also participate using the YouTube chat. And again, I've got fantastic colleague Sarah behind the scenes who's helping to relay any questions that coming in from YouTube along to me so that you can be a part of the conversation. Um, if you registered over Zoom, you will get an email in the next couple of days with a link to the recording of this. So I like to remind people of that at the beginning because sometimes we cover so much information in an hour that it can be really hard to feel like you're catching all of it. So the best part about getting the recorded link is that you can pause it and you know go to a website or play around with something and then come back and listen or watch the rest. So um, keep an eye out for that. And if you are watching on YouTube, you can always go to our Bird Academy page and check out the recording to this uh, webinar as well as countless other webinars we've hosted over the past couple of years. Um, I think I've covered everything. Um, so let's get started. Um, thank you again, Audrey, Julia, and Andrew for being here today. Um, I'd love to get started by just hearing about you and your background and a little bit about what you do uh, for the lab. And we can go in the order that you all will be presenting. So we'll start with Audrey, and then we'll go to Julia, and then Andrew. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Audrey. I work remotely from Seattle for the lab, so I'm one of our West Coast representatives. Um, I've been at the lab about a year and a half, and I've worked with BirdCast as well as some other projects, mostly doing data visualization work, um, as well as other work that we need for eBird or Merlin. Um, my background before this is actually in journalism. I was working for quite a few years um, making graphics and other kind of data interactives in that setting. Um, but decided to take a break from that and try out something that was first a hobby and has brought me a lot of joy over the past few years, which is um, learning more about birds. So I'm happy to be here at the lab. Wonderful. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Julia. I'm based in Austin, Texas. I also work remotely for the lab, and I've been a BirdCast project leader since 2020. I work mostly on our science to action sort of campaigns, um, on the coordination of all of those. And my background originally was in poli sci. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew. Um, I'm a senior research associate at the lab. I actually work remotely also. Uh, I'm in New York State, but I'm downstate in Manhattan in New York City. Uh, before I did this, which uh, I've been doing at the lab now on and off for maybe 15 or 20 years now, I still studied birds. <laughs> um, and I've uh, been interested in migration uh, for my whole life. So this is a really wonderful opportunity. I'm ha happy that you're all here in the audience today. This uh, team, part of which you'll hear from today, is an exceptional, exceptional group of people uh, working at a really wonderful place. So we're looking forward to telling you all about migration today and also various things we can do to help migration along and also study it and, and uh, experience it. So onward. Thank you for being here. Great. All right. So I think we're going to kick things off with you, Audrey. And uh, when you while you start screen sharing, I'm going to pop a link to uh, the the space within Birdcast that you're going to be speaking about specifically. All right. So um, I'm going to be walking through the migration dashboard just a little bit for folks who might not have visited in a while or maybe are new to it. We first launched the dashboard just about a year ago. Um, just about a year ago, we actually gave a talk introducing it for the first time to you all. So it's nice to be able to revisit it. Um, I wanted to kind of like review kind of what products Birdcast had up until we launched the dashboard. Uh, for a while, we've been able to provide forecasts of migration intensity over the next few nights to give a sense of what we think might happen. That's what these are. Uh, some of you may recognize those, as well as a sense of what has already happened the night before um, throughout the night. But both of these are um, on an overall, like fully national level uh, and can't really tell you what's happening right in the moment. It's either a look to the future or a look into the past. So one of the things that the dashboard has been able to give us is more of a view into what's happening right now on any given night when it comes to bird migration. And we can show a lot more granular data as well as showing it on down to a county level for any county in the contiguous United States. Um, so I just kind of wanted to walk through it and highlight some of the things that you might be able to poke around on on your own in your free time. Um, the URL is dashboard.birdcast.info. So this is kind of our landing page. And from here, you can search for any state or county in the lower 48. Oops, so let's try Texas. Um, Texas had a huge night last night. We can already see that just based on some of the numbers at the top in this little, like, little badge here that says that it was a high night. So almost 85 million birds crossed Texas last night, according to BirdCast. Um, and we also get a snapshot here of sort of what that looked like at the peak time of the night. So upwards of like 177 million birds were crossing Texas last night, uh, moving in sort of a northerly direction, which we'd expect for this time of year, um, as well as some other statistics about what was going on. Um, for people that care to really get into the details of it, we provide a lot of different ways of looking at what's going on. Uh, one of those is across the night, um, we can see how many birds in flight uh, there were at any given time. So starting right at sunset and all the way until sunrise the next morning, which is when we run our kind of live data feed, um, we can see that there was this nice increase throughout the night um, of how many birds were actually in the air. And you can compare that to this gray arc down here below, which is a historic average to give you a sense of whether this is kind of normal or out of the ordinary. 
Um, similarly, we also give information throughout the night on what direction birds were generally flying, as well as the average speed that they were flying at. And we also show what average altitude they were flying at throughout the night, again, with this gray historic average to be able to compare it to. Um, in addition, we also wanted to give a sense for people that might want more context or just compare it to like, is this normal? Is this really special? Um, give a sense of how things are going throughout the whole season. So we can see that right now for April 30th, which was last night, this was actually one of the largest surges of migrations in Texas for this whole season. Uh, we started out in March with just kind of like, you know, chugging along here and really things started to get very active right around like kind of the end of April, which again, if you compare this to um, the gray curve we have here, comparing it to historic data, it's pretty expected, um, but the, at the same time, definitely exciting. Um, and this final curve here shows kind of the cumulative number of birds that have crossed Texas throughout the entire season. So that's a curve that's gonna go up over time, but we can see that right now we're really kind of in the middle sweet spot and tracking pretty well with historic averages, maybe just a little bit lower, um, but, you know, pretty much you can see that the historic that the historic numbers match pretty well with what we're seeing today. Um, another exciting feature of this that we're testing out is um, being able to show what expected nocturnal migrants we're actually seeing coming through. So because we're using radar data to detect um, the number of birds that are passing through, that technology can't actually identify any given bird and tell you what species it is. But we can give you a pretty good sense of what might be up there based on the historic records we have from eBird. So that's people that have been submitting their own observations of what species they're seeing at this time of year in specific places. So based on that, we can actually get a pretty good sense of what kinds of species might be flying through and representing these numbers. Um, as a reminder, because we're talking about nocturnal migration, this is all happening at nighttime. We turn on the live data feed right around sunset every night for any given region and turn it off at sunrise the next morning. So that means that if you come to this page during the day, you're gonna see the results from the previous night. Um, but if you're like a real fanatic and you wanna see what's going on at midnight, um, if you come to this page, you'll actually be getting near real-time data. It comes in about every 10 to 20 minutes. Um, so you can track what's truly going on right above your head. Um, additionally, you can go back and explore any date. We have, I think, currently the last two years of data loaded into the dashboard. So that is both for spring and fall migration. Um, so you can explore different days. If you see a peak on a certain day and you're curious to learn more about it, let's say April 27th here, you can just get into that data right from here. Um, additionally, we can look up, like I said, any state or county. So just to prove that point, let's go ahead and just look up another place. And we'll see that for here, we have completely different numbers, uh, different expected migrants are gonna show up here. So this is really tailored to your local environment or a place that you might wanna be tracking. Um, Okay, that's a pretty kind of brief overview. I'm sure a lot of people have maybe seen this tool already, so we just kind of wanted to give people a reminder of it. Um, but happy to pause if there are any any questions about this. There are a couple questions coming up, Audrey. One is, um, is this just in the US? Is there anything for Canada or Mexico? Yeah, that's a question we get a lot. This is just for the US right now, and that actually doesn't include Alaska or Hawaii. So it's the contiguous United States, the lower 48. Um, we definitely get the question, especially about Canada a lot. Uh, Andrew can speak to this more, but I believe that because our data is coming from an American institution, we're getting it from the National Weather Service. I think there's more complication there that would just take longer to expand this elsewhere. But Andrew, feel free to jump in if, if there's more nuance to that. No, that's the that's the nuance. Uh, basically, federally funded project in the U.S. Uh, and federally funded institutions, so publicly available data, uh, very easily, very different from the rest of the world. Um, where, for example, in the European Union, where there is an enormous amount of radar information that comes in, but each country controls its own meteorological office, and there's all sorts of geopolitics involved. So, uh, a little different in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Audrey, we, there's a question about what the difference is between the two numbers on the left and the right. Mm -hmm. 
That's up here at the top, the big numbers. Yep. yep. The yeah, that's a good question as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a bit of a, a nuanced difference between the two. So we can both track how many birds are in flight at any given point. So that's actually this number here. So 400, basically 400,000 birds in flight. You know, in theory, that means like if you looked up in the air and you had night vision and you could, you had the power to see the entire sky across LA County, that's how many birds you would detect. Okay. Um, we're highlighting here the highest number throughout the night. So that's kind of what we're calling peak migration. Mm -hmm. um, so for, you know, this day on April 27th, that was around 11, 10 p.m. in LA. Um, the bigger number over on the left is the total number of birds throughout the night that have actually made it across the entire county. So since when we're thinking about migration, I mean, part of that is the vast distances that these birds are traveling. Um, that's sort of getting at a slightly different thing, which is why that number is often going to be lower than the number of birds in flight, because especially when you're maybe talking about a, as big of a region as the state of Texas, many of the birds that are in the air might not actually make it across the entire state, so they're not going to be included in that number. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, uh, how far back is the historical data going that, the, that some of these numbers are based on? Yeah, we have the data quite a far, far away, far, far back. Um, currently, we have two years worth in the dashboard. So I believe it goes back to, I think it's fall 2021 right now. Uh, and I should mention that for each season, so spring migration, we're defining as March 1st to June 15th. So we turn on the app March 1st, we're about halfway through, um, and then it'll go back to sleep in June, uh, you can still definitely always access kind of the historic data that we have up. And then we'll go online again in the fall. Um, I believe it is uh, August. No, is it some, is it August 1st? And then goes through November 15th. Okay. And there's, I see there's a lot of questions here about um, sort of how this is all done. And Andrew's actually going to get into that uh, towards the end of, or, you know, towards the midpoint, we wanted to start with something that you could really look at, like, totally based on where you live and, you know, put into practical use, like for tonight. Um, and uh, so we're going to get to some of the bigger questions that you've got here in the, in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, Audrey, uh, we're getting, uh, could you maybe Highlight one more time the question between the two big numbers. We're getting a couple more questions about confusion around that. <laughs> sure. So um, the number on the, I'll, I'll maybe go in reverse this time. So the okay. number on the left, that large number, that's the total number of birds throughout the whole night. So when we start tracking at sunset to sunrise that have um, passed through the entire county. So let's just super basic. Let's say they're flying from south to north. That's 277,000 birds that have flown from the bottom of LA County successfully all the way through the county and have passed on to whichever county is north of there. <laughs> um, the smaller number, this peak migration traffic number, that's at any given moment. We can track that here in this chart actually as well. That's the number of birds that are in the air at any given point. And this is the maximum number um, that we've been able to detect uh, at some time during the night. So these aren't necessarily birds that are all making it across that like that finish line. They've cleared LA County and they're on their way somewhere else. It's just the number of birds that are in the air um, at that time. Right, not necessarily on their way in and out of the county, but are in the area. In progress, yeah. Got it, okay. Maybe the difference if you thought about like a, a foot race, like a marathon, it's the number of participants in the race versus the number who actually successfully finished the race yeah. in a certain amount of time. That's, that's a very that's on the fly point. metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, okay. Um, is there anything else that you wanna share specifically about the dashboard or people using it uh, for, for their own uses? Yeah, I think just one thing I wanted to highlight that I think Andrew will get into more, but you know, a lot of this can just look like, wow, how do I even make sense of any of this? Um, but that's part of what's so interesting about it is right, you can see it starts to like lead to a lot of questions like what's going on in LA? We're seeing some patterns of some like really big, almost like regular spikes here. And when you look at different areas, you might see a very different pattern. And that actually like can really map with things we know are going on in terms of geography or weather patterns or things like that. So it's really interesting when you start getting into the actual stories behind it, which I think Andrew's going to touch on more later. Right. 
Um, thank you. So fascinating. I don't think that we're like done talking about the dashboard <laughs> specifically, but I wanted to um, switch gears for just the moment and ask Julia to come on and talk about how we might be able to help some of these thousands and thousands of birds <laughs> flying yeah. out for us at night. Absolutely, it's nice to do so. What with all the birds moving through um, the continental US with peak migration, we're really excited to share ways that you can use our tools to combat some of the issues these birds are facing during a particularly dangerous period of their lives. Let me just pull up some slides and we can get right into it. All right, so we wanted to frame this in the context of birds uh, over the last couple of decades um, in this context of loss um, where we've Hold lost- Hold on, Julia, we're, we're actually just seeing a gray screen right now. Oh, okay. We saw, I saw your slides for a second, but now it's just gray. Huh, give me one second. No problem. There we go, now we can see them. Okay, let me see if this works as meant here. One second. Okay, are you guys seeing them now? No, we're, oh, there we go, there we go. <laughs> Okay, perfect. All right. So back to it. Uh, we wanted to present this in the context of the bird losses that we've suffered over the course of the last couple of decades, um, wherein we've seen about one in four birds or about three billion birds lost since 1970 in under the span of a single human lifetime, many of these being migratory birds. Um, and what with bird cast preoccupation with forecasting when and where a lot of these migratory birds are moving, we hope that you're able to use our tools in order to better understand and react to these birds to help protect them. One of the major sources of mortality for these birds is collision, which is um, a problem anywhere. There are buildings, residences, power lines, wind turbines, et cetera, especially among buildings and residences, which amount to hundreds of millions of estimated collisions in the US annually. Um, and birdcast can help us better understand when birds are going to be passing these buildings in particular or these wind turbines in particular, so we know better where to site wind turbines, when buildings should react in a certain way to birds passing through. And here you can see a couple of examples of what happens when we don't have these sort of safeguarding conservation practices in effect. Um, unfortunately, light pollution is an implicating factor in collisions um, as light pollution, well, let me go back a couple of steps. A lot of migratory birds, the majority of them, about 80% of North American migratory birds migrate at night, navigating using the stars and other natural signals. And the light pollution coming from our urban centers can draw them away from their normal pathways towards these sort of urban ha hazards, including building collisions and collisions with residences and exposures to toxins and such. Our focus on this page is some of the major mass mortality building collisions that have happened where light pollution has been implicated over the last couple of years. And so if you take a look on the left, you can see um, a terribly sad example in Manhattan from 2021. This is a collision monitor out in the morning collecting hundreds and hundreds of birds. Here's an article in the middle about a similar event in Philadelphia that killed uh, likely upwards of a thousand in a single night as well. And to the far right, you can see something that's a little more personal to me here in Texas, a collision that happened in 2017 at a single lit building during a migration night of poor weather, which killed uh, nearly 400 birds in a single night. And so here uh, you can see 
a little bit of the effect that these lights have on birds. The video that is playing to the left is actually of the 9-11 Memorial and Tribute and Light in New York City, which shines every year on 9-11 um, and consists of some very, very bright xenon lights. And what you're seeing swirling in these lights is not in fact insects, but rather uh, birds sort of trapped in these beams um, endlessly circling. Um, which is very unfortunate in exhausting them, distracting them, et cetera, and generally distracting from their natural behavior. We've been working with New York City Audubon um, and the Memorial and Light for the last several years in order to monitor, film, and deal with this phenomenon. The good news is that turning off these lights very rapidly returns birds to normal behavior and they disperse very quickly. So approximately every 20 minutes, the lights are shut off and birds, um, which are circling often in the thousands, if not the tens of thousands, will return to just a normal couple of hundred. And here you can see a radar scan of that density change from 10, 12 p.m. to 10, 32 p.m. when lights are off versus on in Manhattan from 2015. That's incredible. Such a striking yeah. difference. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> to see from overhead like that. Yeah, so um, quickly. Yeah, no, for real. And here we can also see um, another sort of case study of this effect of light pollution on birds. This building is known as McCormick Center in Chicago. It's, uh, I believe, the largest convention, convention center in the lower 48. And it's a huge primarily glass building located um, right off of the lake, which sees a lot of migratory birds passing through. And unfortunately, it is a major bird killer with that location, with all that glass, and with a lot of light emitting from the glass. But the good news is here is that um, Cormac Center has been working with us and the Chicago Field Museum for um, a couple of decades now to better understand this light pollution mortality problem. And so there's a pretty extensive data set there that we've taken a look at. And what we've seen, what we know from this sort of data set from the last 20 years is that, uh, first of all, the worst collisions, the, the greatest number of collisions often happen due to a high volume of migration and poor weather and uh, the amount of light emitted from the building. And secondly, that reducing the light emitted from that building reduces the birds that die colliding with that building every night. In fact, if we reduce the building to historically low light levels, um, we save about an estimated about 60% of birds. This is in contrast to when the building is totally lit, when we estimate that about, there's an estimated 76% increase in mortalities at that building instead. So we see that increasing or decreasing the amount of light coming from buildings um, changes the collisions. And so given all that, we support um, people, buildings, cities, whoever possible following lights out guidelines, especially during migration and especially during periods of particularly high migration when birds are likely to be at risk. Um, this is a rather extensive list of guidelines which you can find at BirdCast on our Signs to Action Lights Out page with a lot more information about this. But generally we recommend that as much as possible, people turn off non-essential lighting during migration from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. And where it's not possible to turn things off to keep them low, um, long, or shielded. And I just put the link to the Lights Out website in the chat so everybody can check that out and bookmark it to see all of the different things they could do at their own homes. Thank you. Um, so here's an example of uh, one of the ways that BirdCast has been working on Lights Out. We've been heavily involved in coordinating the Lights Out Texas effort, working with cities, uh, building owners and managers, as well as the community and residences in Texas, given um, a conservation need of high migration volume and high light pollution in Texas. And so what you can see in this little animation is spring 2021, um, the Dallas mayor issued a lights out proclamation 
in Dallas, which he's been doing for the last couple of seasons, um, asking city buildings to turn off their lights during peak migration nights. And so you have this beautiful skyline, um, lovely and dark for migration to protect birds and a couple of a smattering of articles about the rest of the effort which has grown both across Texas and across the country um, leveraging bird cast tools. And so the tool that I in particular wanted to talk to you guys about today is our migration alerts so that we are all better able to respond to these uh, peak nights of migration. And this is a tool that you may already be familiar with that we started betaing in 2021. Um, and you can find it um, both on our main uh, page, birdcast.info, as well as under migration tools labeled as migration alerts. This is also a tool uh, for the lower 48. And you can enter your city or your county and figure out the predictions for that night and the next two nights for your area about what we're expecting. If we're expecting low migration, medium migration, or high migration for that night for your area. If it's a night of high migration, it triggers what we call a migration alert, where we ask you to turn lights out to save migrating birds. Of course, we'd love if you turn your lights out as much as possible throughout migration, but if there are uh, conflicting obligations and such, we prioritize these nights and would love to let you know. As of this spring, we have also provided an expanded subscribe to alerts function, which I'll show you over here. Um, over on the left, you can see all of the cities that we currently allow to subscribe to alerts. These uh, alerts if you subscribe will be sent to your uh, inbox, your email inbox, um, on the day that the alert is issued, earlier in the day, to give you a little time to react to it. Uh, the alert, the email alert, looks like the one that you'll see on the right here, which was issued a few weeks ago here in Texas, or actually the 27th of April, so more recently than that, just this last week. Um, and so to head off the question that I know is looming, why do we only offer the alerts in these cities? Um, we've recently expanded our alerts from just Texas, where we were working in a number of cities on lights out efforts, to a broader array of cities across the US that are concerns in terms of the interaction between migration volume and light pollution and are thus priorities for us. Um, we're hoping to expand this feature in the future um, as we are able to support it, but as of this moment, alerts are currently enabled for these cities via email. So feel free to go check it out, subscribe, and learn more on the broadcast website under Migration Tools and Science to Action. Um, and with that, I'll leave you with a little video that we've just put together and released this spring about uh, light pollution and broadcast. <laughs> Birds bring us joy and are vital to our planet's ecosystems, but they are disappearing from our skies. According to a recent study, three billion birds, that's one in four, have been lost during the last 50 years in the US and Canada alone. But we can help. I'm Jane Alexander, and I'm hoping that during this migration season, you will turn out lights for birds. Most migrating birds travel at night. Lights can attract and disorient birds, bringing them dangerously close to buildings and other structures. Reflections in glass confuse birds, which causes collisions. And collision, especially with glass windows, and facades is a leading cause of bird deaths. I'm asking for your help to darken the night sky. By turning off your non-essential lights, you can help keep birds safe on their flights at night. To learn more about bird migration, visit birdcast.info. Thank you, Julia. Um, we have some great questions here. Um, 
a couple include, are there um, benefits to buildings turning off lights? You sort of briefly mentioned that you're working with building managers, um, but there's quite a few questions about, you know, doesn't it save money in electric bills to have, you know, these cities turning off their lights or these buildings reducing the number of lights that are on overnight? Is that an angle that you're using when you're speaking to some of these groups? Uh, it's definitely an angle, and we definitely think it's a win-win for everyone, reducing that light pollution for the benefit of the birds, the insects, for people, and our ability to sleep at night so that the dark sky at night remains dark. And so one of the things we do talk to you about buildings with is certainly energy savings, as well as protecting the birds and all of these things. Um, we do, it's, it's of benefit, of course, to work with these major commercial buildings and with these cities, and we hope to continue to do so. But I want to emphasize here that it's really a benefit that everyone turn off their lights during migration as much as possible, especially as the issue of light pollution is very much sort of a cumulative sky glow issue. And so all of our lights sort of play into that. That makes sense. There's also quite a few questions about uh, different colored lights, like do yellow lights or blue lights or red lights, you know, offer any sort of benefits to birds instead of sort of the white light? Yes. So I'm sure Andrew can speak more to this, but to my best understanding, blue and white lights are the most sort of attractants and harmful to birds in that way. And with so we have different sort of wavelengths that are better for different animals, whether that be sea turtles or birds or insects. And with birds, we've tended to see better results in terms of not being attracted with longer wavelength lights, flashing lights, say red flashing lights. Um, and of course, there's a lot more research, I think, that can probably go into that. But the longer wavelengths are safe for birds. Great. All right, I want to make sure we have time for you to review what's what's been going on these last, you know, this this most recent migration season, Andrew, and then we'll get to some of these other big picture questions that are lingering in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Julia. It's so fascinating. And I hope everyone will check out the links I put in the chat because there's so much great information that will actually answer a lot of the questions um, that you've that you've asked about, you know, which other locations and cities are participating and how you might be able to help encourage participation where you live. All right, on to you, Andrew. All right, uh, thank you so much. Um, that was it's awesome to have Audrey and Julia talk about these the, these two different components of what go into Birdcast. So, what I'm going to talk about now is just a couple of updates uh, that uh, relate to the biology and the ornithology and what we've seen so far this spring, and relate it to some bigger picture patterns with weather, and, and maybe just talk a little bit sort of about the spectacle and so on. So um, let me uh, jump into the, the updates. So in terms of um, just a little background, we know that from the, the radar perspective and monitoring the skies above the contiguous US um, that we have these 143 radars that are monitoring the skies almost continuously. They're detecting meteorology and biology up there. And in the spring and fall, the biology is often dominated by birds and we can filter out the weather. So when you see a map like this, uh, in this case, the, the what we call the observed or live map from last night, you're seeing that weather removed. Uh, and, and I'll talk about this in a second, but let me just highlight um, it's pretty uneven, right? So uh, even even a very cursory view of this map, you can see there are some places where there are these black colors or dark, very the purples, um, which is either very little or no migration happening. And that's in stark contrast to these areas where the really intense yellows and whites are, which is really high intensity migration. And that it's not evenly distributed around the country. And so last night in particular, it was uh, still a reasonably good night, mostly uh, with birds migrating in the southern US with a little bit of an edge up through the, the Great Plains there. But talking about a third of a billion birds aloft last night, so a pre pretty big number when it comes down to it, uh, sort of thinking along the lines of like one bird for every human in the US moving last night, uh, pretty amazing. Now. Related to this pattern, um, oh, and by the way, this is sort of expected for this time of the year. Early May is really starting to be a time when we're seeing the peak of birds arriving into the southern U.S. and the movement starting to really percolate in waves up uh, farther to the north. So um, with that in mind, 
thinking a little bit about, well, why do we see this really odd pattern um, where some places have no migration, others have really intense migration? It's pretty simple when it comes down to it. Um, the places on the map where you see the dark areas are very low intensity or no migration in the spring, right, last night, that's associated with these cold air masses where temperatures are cool. Um, and birds usually experience headwinds, so winds blowing from the north as birds are trying to move generally north. That's not really conducive to birds uh, making much progress in terms of migration, whereas where you see intense migration uh, in where these red circles are, um, those are warmer temperatures, warm air masses, nice moist air masses, sort of very typical of what we think of as spring and, and summer like in some respects. And also with tailwinds, so winds generally blowing from the south, uh, often supporting birds movements as they head north. So that's just kind of a one way to think about, well, how do I make sense of where these these movements are going to occur or why they've occurred in particular locations broadly. It has to do with this um, weather at meteorology at sort of a larger scale, a regional or a continental scale or synoptic scale, as some people will call it. So um, that was last night. This is a tonight forecast that's going what we expect to occur. You'll notice a similar kind of a pattern um, where in the uh, Great Lakes and upper Midwest and portions of the northeastern US and also the mountainous west. We're not expecting very much migration, but of course in the south, in Texas and in parts of the southeast, again where those warm temperatures are and those nice tailwinds, those southerly winds, that's where we're expecting to see a lot of migration. And, and this is pretty characteristic. This, this is what we expect um, as the, the season goes on, those intensity of movements, those high intensity movements, the oranges and yellows, that'll spread further, further north. Um, but this is uh, sort of par for the course when we think about the beginning of May, end of April. So we're, we're kind of seeing what we expect, especially when it comes to the way that every once in a while in late April and early May, we see these really cold air masses come across the U.S. and they tend to just shut down migration when that happens. And that's exactly what we've seen here. So let me dig in a little bit deeper. Uh, I know we're running a little short on time, so I'll try to be, be quick. Uh, not, not one of my skills, but I'll try. <laughs> um, so I want to focus a little bit more on a really interesting part of the U.S. when it comes to spring migration, uh, the Gulf Coast. In this case, the eastern Gulf of Mexico coast, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, the Florida Panhandle, and something really interesting that happened a couple of days ago. So. Um, I know there was a question about where we get our data and sort of what the, the raw data are all about. So that map I showed you before is really talking only about the bird uh, component, the, the, the biology that's dominated by birds. If you were to look at whether um, data is provided by your local meteorological service or uh, on broadcast meteorology on television, you might see a map more like this, even something more extreme where they're really blocky and irregular patterns characteristic of precipitation are still included in the map. We've obviously taken those things out. And by contrast, the very stippled uniform patterns that you see, uh, in particular over parts of Texas and in, in California, that's biology, that's birds. So in this sort of a, a raw version of the radar data where we can see the meteorology and the ornithology that's happening, I call your attention to this red circle area and that this again was a couple of days ago on the 27th of April. So some of you that either in are in the southeastern US, maybe in Alabama or Florida or are watching the Weather Channel regularly, um, you know that there were some really severe storms that passed through there and basically these were associated with the boundary between air masses, so some of those warm air masses like characteristic over the Gulf of Mexico warm moist air and this more Canadian air mass that's cold, drier, and where those collide, these incredible storms happen. Where these circles, uh, the, where the circle is, that's very intense precipitation, and it's precipitation that's over the Gulf of Mexico. And as some of you may know, and many of you will know after I say this, a tremendous number of the birds that migrate into the U.S. every spring do so coming over the Gulf of Mexico. So they're migrating over water from points farther south in northern South America, the Caribbean, Central America, and Mexico. And they're entering the U.S. from over water and arriving on the Gulf Coast. And when they encounter situations like this, it can be extremely challenging for them because they're flying through heavy rain, often uh, turbulence associated with thunderstorms, lightning, 
and winds that are incredibly changeable. So imagine a small songbird trying to fly through the most intense thunderstorm you can think of. You don't even want to do that in a plane, and pilots won't usually. But birds are doing this on a regular basis. Just another perspective for those that have, have seen these kinds of maps. So that was a radar perspective I gave you. These are satellite imagery, and you're seeing where the all these whites, these clouds are shown up. That's the water vapor that's in the atmosphere. So this is an infrared image of where we see clouds and where it's white and where it's very white. Those are super high clouds associated with really strong thunderstorms. And then a meteorologist has come in and drawn on on the map where the frontal boundaries are. So where those boundaries are between air masses. And so what's happening here is in that area where the red circle is, all those birds, those hundreds of millions of birds that are migrating across the Gulf of Mexico, coming from the south, from uh, South America and the Caribbean and Yucatan Peninsula, are encountering this incredible storm. And when they do so, obviously, they need to find shelter or try to immediately. Over the Gulf of Mexico, not much shelter. So they tend to drop from the altitudes they're flying, which can be even up to a, a few thousand feet above the water. They tend to drop very low and then make a beeline toward land. And sometimes when that happens, we have these incredible scenarios where if there are observers on the ground, which at this point there often are many, many of them, for example, this one uh, observer in Mobile County, Alabama, sometimes we see these absolutely incredible spectacles. So you, if you look where the circles are, and uh, even if it's blurry, let me just highlight what's happening here. So the circle that's you know up representing the number of individuals, 50,000, more than 50,000 individual birds um, in this, this observation, this eBird checklist, um, most of which occurred over about an hour long period of birds that were flying over the Gulf of Mexico, coming into this area of Dauphin Island in Alabama, and either landing quickly and moving on or falling out there and staying there. Enormous numbers of birds, including 15,000 plus red-eyed vireos, um, more than many of us may actually ever see in a lifetime unless we're lucky enough to see an event like this. Something like six to 7,000 rose-breasted grosbeaks. I mean, just staggering numbers of birds. And this is just one observation in this area where a lucky and probably a very tuned in observer went specifically to think, I wanna to try to experience one of these incredible fallout scenarios. So uh, this is an example of what happens when birds that are migrating over water suddenly encounter these kinds of scenarios and then come down and land and, and we get to see what happens as they come ashore. Now, I wanna highlight, there are often questions, well, what, what happens to these birds? Um, in this case, something sort of interesting happened. So again, where the circle is here, this is the area of interest. And what you're seeing, remember those lines, the blues and red lines I, I was telling you about that are drawn on by meteorologists um, and where the, those are the boundaries between air masses. There's a very clear area just to the west of this huge area of storms, this white, these clouds I was telling you about before. There's a clear area and this red line up here represents a warm front and this sort of clear area with still some warm moist air that has not been influenced by this kind of Canadian air mass means that conditions are actually still pretty favorable for migration. So even though these birds have taken this a tremendous hit in flying through intense rain and then come ashore in Alabama, when it comes to what happens when, they, the, when it gets dark and when they start migrating again, they take off on mass because conditions are still good and and one of the interesting ways audrey mentioned this that we can use the dashboard is start to think about well why do we see these kinds of patterns that we see in the dashboard and how can we connect it to some kind of a uh, an activity we see on the ground here so again just to reorient you back to to this upper right uh, excuse me upper left graphic of birds in flight and the pattern of birds in flight that happened over the course of this night on the 27th and 28th this is for Mobile County, where this observer had this incredible observation of all these birds. And what we see is just after sunset, sunset is where this zero line is, just after a local sunset, there's this incredible pulse of birds that comes up into the atmosphere. Those are all those birds that have just come ashore and have landed in this coastal habitat and are now emerging as they begin their migration, uh, continuing it uh, over the course of the night in these favorable conditions. And you'll also notice that this happened to be an incredible peak night for this county, uh, the highest so far this spring. 
to zoom out just a tiny bit, if we look at Alabama in general, obviously you see a little bit of a different pattern, still an incredibly high uh, peak night here. But obviously when you start to integrate across the entire state and not just a uh, county per se, you start to see a different pattern of when the largest numbers of birds are aloft. And again, the dashboard is this kind of very granular data that allows us to to look at this and think about the direction and speed that these birds are moving. Almost all of them are moving north or northeast. They're moving approximately an average 35, um, 30 to 35 miles an hour. And they're traveling uh, approximately two to 3,000 feet above the ground. So as we start to think a little more broadly, well, all right, these birds that have left the coastline in, um, in the Florida Panhandle area and uh, the Gulf Coast of Alabama and Mississippi, if they're flying at this speed and they take off at sunset and we look at a radar image, for example, about four or five hours later, we see that big pulse where this bright white area is about 130 or 140 miles inland, uh, including a little bit farther of where that pulse is moving. So all those birds that have come ashore in that massive thunderstorm event or that have that have survived and have landed they're continuing on their migration and to add a little bit more to the flavor and sort of build back in what's happening remember when we look at the more raw data and can start to see where the weather is happening there's some pretty intense precipitation still uh, that these birds will eventually encounter if they continue flying as far as they absolutely can. But in this area where Alabama is and sort of pretty much the whole state of Alabama into some of Tennessee, it's much more clear sailing. So uh, these are the kinds of perspectives that we can glean when we understand a little bit more about weather radar uh, that we can look at in almost real time and certainly just after the fact to kind of give us a sense of, well, what's gonna be happening in our area or what has just happened and why. And of course you can visit the BirdCast website and see some of these things. You can be in touch with us to ask questions about it. But I think I've left a, enough time, uh, Lisa, for, for maybe a few questions or maybe a lot of questions. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> there may be a lot, but happy to entertain them. That was great. You answered a lot of the questions from earlier. Um, there are a few questions that, uh, you know, are. They're really sort of speaking to the kind of work that you all do. Um, one is, do you guys work all night? Do you, do you have a nighttime schedule or how does it work with the data? Like when is it sort of posted versus, you know, <laughs> when is it considered live or updated? <laughs> yeah, we're chronically sleep deprived. Um, maybe not, not, not so much as we used to be though, because a lot of this is now automated because we've um, this interesting situation where really over the last 10 years, we've shifted into the, the era of big data where these, the, the uh, cloud-based storage and the way Amazon, which provides these radar data for free with a partnership with, uh, with NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, um, we can create these pipelines and use machine learning, artificial intelligence, to uh, automate the extraction of the radar data, to remove the meteorology from the birds, and then create a pipeline where we can produce that so we don't have to stay up all night and do the interpretation. If you rewind, you know, 20 plus years to the original version of BirdCast, it was very much staying up all night to monitor downloading over a phone line and like hoping you would upload the images that they would post to the, you know, the BirdCast server and quickly typing in a forecast. None of it was automated. Um, now it is a very different scenario. So sure, we can stay up all night and watch the, the data come in, but thankfully we don't actually have to be responsible for it coming in to stay up all night. We can check it the following morning or go off and do something else. Um, as you, you probably got the sense from looking at this, um, the radar data don't tell us what the species are, right? So in order to know what the species are, well, we kind of do need to stay up all night. We can go out and listen to migration and identify flight calls, the next big breakthrough in automation, which maybe next year or the year after, hopefully we'll be able to talk about that. But, um, but thankfully we don't have to stay awake all night unless we really want to and just watch the screen change. That's great. And that's incredible that, you know, like a sneak peek about because there are some questions about how do you understand what's actually flying over and 
Um, you mentioned that, you know, some of the likely species information that's shown on the dashboard that Audrey, that Audrey gave us a, a glimpse of is um, coming from eBird, but it sounds like you're working on something that would really be able to maybe pinpoint some of that in, in uh, based on what, what's being heard at night. <laughs> yeah, the acoustic monitoring side for, for those that, um, that know, uh, birds are giving specific vocalizations when they're migrating at night that sometimes we hear at other times of the day as well, uh, that we can use to identify birds. And for those that don't know, there are all sorts of different vocalizations that birds give. Uh, singing is one type of vocalization. These special calls that they're using at night are very, um, very unique and they're often very short. Uh, sometimes less than um, 100 milliseconds, so really requiring fine tuning in terms of your skills to identify them, which is part of the reason that we're teaching computers to do this. Mm -hmm. um, the, in addition to the acoustic monitoring, there are rare cases, you, you saw the tribute in light footage that Julia showed, maybe some of you have uh, have been on top of the Empire State Building at night or other places, even around things like car dealerships or in Chicago where there are bright lights or in Texas, where we're trying to get those lights diminished. Where there is light like that, you can see migration happening and you can identify the birds that are flying overhead at night. So it can be a very useful way to try to understand what's happening for that perspective. But by no means are we advocating that as an approach to identifying what's happening at night. We want to eliminate that eventuality, actually, and reduce the light completely because it does create serious issues. But in cases where it does escape and is pointing up, you can actually see and identify the birds, too. So it's one other way to, to really get a feel for the diversity of what's happening at night. Um, and directly, the only other um, really sort of reliable way to do that, it's also very challenging, is to watch the moon. When there's a full moon and you, when you can see it, you put a telescope up on the full moon and take lots of breaks. The moon is very bright through a telescope and it will leave an imprint. I think I can still see the full moon now from so much moon watching, but um, you can see birds flying across the moon that way and also occasionally identify them to at least oh, that's a green heron, or that's some kind of heron, or that's a small passerin, small songbird. Um, so all of these complementary approaches are necessary to really understand migration. That's sort of the key point here is that we need lots of different pieces to understand uh, the whole, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone was just talking to me about how they at the lab was saying that they used to do that, watch the moon and count birds at night, which, you know, talk about how far we've come now looking at this dashboard and you know the maps that you're showing us. Um, there's a lot of questions in here about climate change and if you're seeing and I know you know Andrew you've been working on this for a long time I'm wondering if you can speak to any trends that you're seeing that might speak to climate change or if you're seeing um, more intense weather that's affecting the birds and migration thanks to climate change um, or if you know if you've been looking into that. That's a really good question too. Thank you for it. So from the climate change perspective, we do see some pretty dramatic changes in migration. One of the things that uh, is really apparent to us, and, and we published on this uh, a couple of years ago, is the advance of uh, peak migration. So thinking about in, during spring migration, there's a wave of, of peak movement that really moves through the US. And as you get farther and farther north, that's advancing earlier and earlier in the spring. So basically birds are either trying to speed up or having to speed up. And of course that means that there could be these potential mismatches of when the birds arrive, where they're trying to go relative to the resources that they're trying to use their insects and, and the incredible bloom of insects that happens in the northern hemisphere spring. So yes, climate change is certainly something we can see the, the uh, patterns change. Um, I do want to caution though that um, migration evolved as a result of changing climates. So it's not a surprise that we see changes in this way, that birds are responding to that. What is surprising is the speed of those changes and in places where that creates real challenges for birds. So the speed of the change is real issue. The, the human induced speed is very different from what we've seen over the course of their evolutionary history. And coupled with those population losses, that can create real problems. Um, and, and so too, when it comes to extreme weather, yeah, we do see increasingly extreme situations like that image that I showed you, that, that radar data, showing that really intense kind of storm and that storminess 
that poses a real problem for birds if, when they're crossing these sorts of long uh, stretches of their, their journeys where they may not be able to land. Um, and so uh, it's something we're concerned about increasingly, and uh, especially because it goes hand in hand with other uh, issues that birds are having to deal with, whether it's cats outdoors or habitat loss or uh, you know, uh, reflective glass and buildings related to light pollution, all of these different pieces are contributing to these challenges that birds face. Yeah, there's a lot to contend with, but I mean, I love how much practical information your team is providing people and cities. It's just, it's really inspiring to see some big impacts, like you were saying, um, Julia, you know, that, that you're, you're doing the science to action piece, which is so, so fascinating. And it really feels empowering for people. Um, we're at 1259. I can't believe it. Someone said in the chat that we need two hours for this. I always feel that way talking about BirdCast. We've done quite a few of these webinars. I always walk away so inspired and amazed by the work that you're doing. And I know that so many of the people tuning in feel the exact same way. Um, thank you all for sharing what you do and for doing what you do, because it really is incredible and um, you know really important work that we're so grateful you take the time to share with us. Um, and I'm sure that I will be coming to you and asking you to do another BirdCast webinar soon. So for those of you who didn't get your questions asked, um, make sure you sign up on our website for updates on our upcoming uh, virtual programs. And if you are um, looking to rewatch this or check out any information, uh, look in your inbox tomorrow for a link to the recording of the video. And we will also include some of the key links that we shared in the chat in that email. So um, thank you so much, Audrey, Julia, and Andrew for taking the time to talk with us today. And thank you to the audience for all of your great questions and your participation and your support. Hope everybody has a great rest of your day. All right, bye.